Thanks, Thomas. <clears throat> Thanks, Tobias. That's a, a nice introduction. I appreciate the invitation. And uh, yeah, it's a fitting place because, uh, I mean, people say I am I do lots of work and I'm, I'm interested in everything, but basically it's just because I get bored easily. And then, um, like everyone else, I chase where the money goes. Not, not entirely, but I mean, scientists have to be a bit realistic. Uh, so this project is, in fact, a new one. While I've worked with invasive species uh, of all descriptions pretty much in the past, this is the first time I've really focused on insects. I'm not an entomologist. In fact, I'm not an ologist anything. I, was, uh, I just uh, go with the flow. If I were to describe what I am, it would be a modeler. I would say I'm a, to a room full of non-mathematicians, I would say I'm a mathematician. But if there was a mathematician in the room, I wouldn't say that. So I'm, a, I'm a, an ecological modeler, but I dabble in even non-living uh, systems. I've started recent, I've published my first climatology paper as uh, in two days ago. Well, it got accepted, put it that way. So Geophysical Research Letters, it's a new journal for me. <laughs> uh, this is work that I started with, primarily with um, Franck Cochon, uh, down, uh, where is he? There he is on the end. Um, and Franck is a good friend of mine. He, uh, at the Université Paris-Sud, and um, one of the reasons I went to France is because uh, as you can probably tell from the way I said his name, I speak French and I've been speaking French. My daughter's accompanied me. Si, salut Camille. And she's, she speaks French, but I wanted to give her a sort of a, a French environment for half the year. So I managed this little sabbatical and part of the money came from a French bank, uh, BNP Paribas, which was a grant to Franck to look at the long-term effects of uh, invasive insects on Europe, but we've actually expanded that to the global situation. And this is really the first product that's coming out of that work, so it's actually very fresh. No one's seen this except for you. So excuse the mistakes in the, um, in the coming uh, 40 minutes. So you know, the, I love the invasive literature basically because there's great words like alien and invasive and you know, uh, run for you, no, it's not that sort of thing, but the, the cost and these things are something to be afraid of is part of the, I guess, the morbid attraction, but at the same time, why it's so very important. It's probably one of the parts of ecology that are the easiest to sell to people because it, it concerns health and money, the two things that drive most of society. Now, <laughs> what is an invasive species? Well. If you take the definition on Schlepfer in 2011, I, I, I sort of, we're following this kind of definition. Invasive species are those that are not native to the ecosystem, uh, but they're likely to cause harm, either in economic sense, an environmental sense, or harm to humans or animals or plants. And the term invasive, or non, uh, the term non-native rather, is that those species that occur outside of the historic range, and that's a bit plastic in its definition because ranges, of course, change all the time. But again, coming back to this idea of harm. Now, I think we could all quite think of many invasive species off the top of our heads that uh, are harmful to humans. We're going to focus on insects, basically because most of the harmful species in the world are within one single class of animals, and that's the insects. Uh, we could argue about the total damages, but in terms of uh, economic activity, in terms of studies, and so, certainly in terms of focus, it would have to be primarily on insects. We're familiar with these kinds of uh, issues. Uh, this is an Anopheles uh, mosquito responsible for many different diseases. Of course, one of the most important ones being uh, malaria, which uh, kills many hundreds of milli millions of people over longer times. It's, in fact, malaria affects about between three and 500 million people per year worldwide, with about a million deaths annually. This is these are rough estimates, and most of those are children under the age of five. Dengue is another one, um, mostly transmitted through 80s mosquitoes, with some plastic costs, and we're gonna talk a little bit about the validity of these cost estimates, in fact, this is sort of the genesis of this entire project because you hear a lot of numbers, but very few of them have any validity. Over two billion a year, um, 24,000 deaths in the Americas alone, and again, mostly children. So quite, quite high profile insects. In the case of malaria, uh, we're not really dealing with invasive per se because they're ende it's endemic to much many, many parts of the world, 
notably African countries as well as parts of China. Uh, dengue is more associated with recent introductions of these particular species. Uh, another, I guess, infamous species, of course, would be the red imported fire ant, <clears throat> Solenopsis invicta. Now, uh, you can see some of the damage there up in the corner. People get very nasty reactions to this. I have a personal experience with the red imported fire ant, uh, but mm, 20, uh, a long time ago, several decades ago, I was traveling in Guatemala in Central America, and it, uh, it occurred to me that, um, th that this particular site was a good place to relieve myself, and uh, I did not notice that there was a large fire ant nest uh, right next to the place I'd chosen. And I can describe these little tiny insects. I mean, they're barely visible almost with the naked eye. They're so tiny. They're one of the smallest ant species. Every single one of them felt like a wasp was stinging me. And uh, I had hundreds of them. Thankfully, they only got to my legs and no higher because my pants were down my, down, down my ankles. <laughs> it was not a pretty sight. Uh, uh, I'm glad that uh, Facebook didn't exist back then. Now, they're a native of South America, of course, and they were first detected in, in uh, the United States in 1918. And by 1958, uh, they had uh, occupied uh, something in the vicinity of 25 million hectares. And by um, 1995, it was well over 115 uh, million hectares. And you can just see the rapid expansion of, of the species throughout the southern US. Now, again, this is the this is the impetus, I think, for a lot of the work that's being done on these species. Uh, in terms of, I mean, I don't, I don't think we'll ever get to this kind of scenario here because by that time, I don't think he'd be that overweight, for one, uh, unless, he, of course, he was eating the insects. We have this natural aversion to these species coming in. And how do we, how do we deal with them? Well, I, I'll just go into some more some of the, uh, the history. Now, if this is information put together by the Convention of Biological Diversity, the CBD, this is the cumulative number of species introductions with known introduction dates in only 21 countries. And you notice it's quite sparse, and this is part of the message I have for you today, is that uh, we're missing vast quantities of data despite the, the impressive numbers. We'll come back to that in a minute. Now, the bottom there is a trend indicator where um, the, uh, the value was set to one for 1970, showing across these 21 countries the geometric mean of the cumulative number of, of uh, native invasive, ali sorry, invasive aliens across those countries with the associated confidence interval. Now, what does it mean for the uh, bottom line, as they say? And this is what gets people quite interested. Uh, and it's just some things that might really get, you know, these are some of the most inf infamous species. Most of them are agricultural pests, the western corn rootworm, the cotton bullworm, fruit flies, Th these cost, uh, over several billions of dollars annually. Uh, now, I just want to draw your attention to this one here. This alone, the cotton bollworm, is responsible for well over three and a half billion US dollars annually. Uh, you can see the translation into German euros there. Um, and it's resistant to almost every known class of chemical pesticide. So it's one of these, it's almost like a you know, super, super bug you get in the hospitals. It's one of these things that just are impossible to kill. Uh, other notable examples, diamondback moth, uh, sort of four to five billion a year on brassica crops almost exclusively. Forest pests are a big part, uh, not, not agriculture per se, but uh, agroforestry. Ash borers, um, the cypress aphid, and in, just in general in Brazil, it's been estimated that that country is, is hit with the annual bill of 1.6 billion US annually. Um, <clears throat> but you know, this is where it gets, this is where the plot sickens, as they say. There's a lot of these numbers thrown around. So this is in um, a, a European strategy, EU strategy report that uh, biological, biological invasions of all types, not just insects, so that's control, research, prevention, monitoring, cost Europe somewhere in the vicinity of 12.5 billion euros annually. Uh, another one's in 2001, we had uh, estimates of, uh, most notably from P Dave Pimentel, uh, if you extrapolate all these cited uh, costs, they run into the you know, several percentage points of the total world economy. Um, and you, you'll see these kinds of statements made in papers, but, but when you look at them, um, you really have to sort of wonder where they come from. So when you start you know, returning to the source and you try to find where these numbers come, 
this is often the case is that uh, there is, in fact, no data whatsoever. There, there, they, there usually are estimates from a so-called expert or their back of the envelope calculations from a, from a personal communication. And uh, unfortunately, if we really want to get a handle on what's going on and have any chance of limiting the damage, we're going to have to do a lot better data than that. So this is what we've tried to do in this. Now, when we talk about costs, of course, instantaneously, your, your mind thinks of your wallet. It's the money. It's the, it's the actual liquid value. But, but costs are much more um, broad than that, much more variable. So goods and services, we have everything from direct damage. So that, let me just find my little cursor here. Direct damage, that can be uh, agriculture in general, silviculture, aquaculture. But we also have residual costs that last a long time, plus the original, as well as opportunity costs. We get the cleanup and the infrastructure repair, um, and then indirect costs, changing policies, as well as uh, collateral health and safety issues. On the human health side, we have, the, again, the direct cost of the, of the care and the medication, hospitalization, but we also have indirect for spe specialist training, prevention, even the loss of tourism. And you know, how many people have decided not to go to a particular country because you could get a nasty disease there? Uh, there's also the, the largely unquantified cost of low, lowered productivity and lowered longevity. These are the day, um, disability adjusted life years which is just an, uh, an expression of how much of the, uh, the burden of that disease is on the longevity and productivity of the human. Now there's the ecosystem services part. Now these are by definition something that we should be able to quantify in monetary terms, although in practice it's much more difficult. When we're talking about things like pollination and greenhouse gas emissions, uh, fresh water, soil <laughs> fertility, and, and again on the tourism side. Now there's also the ecological damage, and these almost always lack any sort of even possible monetary evaluation. They are an effect. They will de make uh, populations depauperate. We have all sorts of things, including you know, reductions in subpopulation structure. We have extinction risk increasing. But we also have uh, things as, as, um, as sort of peripheral as natural area management uh, being difficult. Now, if you, as you approach the left, what we see here is sort of a more utilitarian approach. And these are the things that become uh, also easier to measure. So when we come about the esoteric ecological side, they're both difficult to measure and there's not a direct human use, hence uh, the inability to put a, put a cost on them. They also have some costs in common. We have control costs, reduction, eradication, uh, prevention costs, monitoring, as well as suppression, research and development looking into how to suppress and of course public education and I'm doing some of that today although you probably are more in the know than most people. Now when you look at the distribution of all the papers that have been published in the last 50 years you can see some trends so um, these are all invasive species by the way these aren't just uh, insects but we have we have this declining uh, trend from management right down to ecological impacts which mirrors what I was showing you in the previous slide. Most of it, we, talk, we call this ecosystem service, but in actual fact it's just the goods and services mostly related to agriculture and forestry. Um, in terms of the taxa, it's interesting, it's I think the take home message here, it's not a particular taxon of insects uh, in this case, uh, but it's across the board. And then uh, this is another trend one should look out for is, and I'll show you some data to support this, is the more you look the more you find. So let's talk about the goods and services side of things. So what we've done is we've gone through and I've had to hire two people and take, uh, this is work that's gone on for months and months before I even arrived in France. We come through every single published uh, value associated with invasive insects on the planet for the past well, probably about 80 years. Uh, most of it was published in the last 50. And we uh, looked to see what values have been published in any currency at any time associated with any insect. And that was, a, as you can probably appreciate, a massive undertaking. And thankfully, I have some fantastic assistance because I would never do that myself. So what's the breakdown? Um, now, we have two graphs here. One on the left is the all. That's including everything without any sort of reliability score. What do we mean by reliability? Just as I said before, if we return to the source and it's a measured, quantifiable, it can be an extrapolation, but it actually comes from a real number that was measured, as opposed to 
what we say in Australia, pulled out of someone's ass. There's absolutely no source whatsoever. And so as you can see the difference there, um, when you take, a, the number of studies is indicated just below here. You see North America with the most, 34. These might surprise you in just how few studies have been done on these species, despite their massive economic damage. Asia, we found a single study, which of course disappears once you look into it because it actually isn't a measured value. When you add all these values up, you're looking at a minimum, of course, but this is including all studies, of 72 billion US dollars per, per year, just on the goods and services side. Now, about a th two thirds of those, of course, come from nothing. So it's what the true value is, we're not quite sure. Now this is, again, where it gets particularly interesting, I think. If you plot by region the number of studies versus the amount of damages estimated, you see a fairly tight, I mean, it's a few number of regions, I grant you, but um, I'm going to do something that no modeler should ever do. I'm going to say, okay, let's assume that all those regions have the same number of studies as the region with the most. Okay, so we're just basically going to flatten that line, right? If you do that, your number inflates to something in the vicinity of 240 billion US dollars annually. Now that's, I'm not going to say that's what it costs. Now if you remember, the fewer number of studies that have already been done, assuming that we haven't studied everything yet, and the fact that in some regions we have no studies at all. It's a, it's a, a staggering number. So between three and five times, uh, we're underestimating at a minimum. What are the species involved? Well, there's, as you imagine, there's quite a few. I said that it's a fairly even distribution throughout. If, um, if we take all the species here, both in the all and the reliable categories, uh, about 88% of the value is with only 10 species, if you take all, or 95% of the value in the reliable studies only with just 10 species. What are those 10 species? Well, I'll give you, I'm not going to go through every one. It's, uh, it's not about the species per se. But I did, did want to point out a few things. If you look at the, this particular species here, which, as you, can probably, as you can see on the right, disappears when you uh, take into the reliable studies only. We are talking about uh, the Formosan subterranean termite, Coptotermes formosus, for, uh, formosanus, rather. Uh, originally from southern China, transported through Taiwan from an, a place called Formosa, hence the name Formosan Subterranean Termite. Uh, eventually ended up in South Africa and Hawaii and America, South America. And each colony can, form, can be of several million individuals can form almost overnight. And they can consume about 400 grams of wood per day. Now it's, uh, that over about three months can collapse entire structures. Can you imagine it's, it's a, quite a costly endeavor and it's spread throughout the world. Now, the cost in excess of $30 billion annually estimated worldwide comes from a single study, and this is what, this is, I'm going to rug you through this. So, the first one was a non-sourced estimate of 2.2 billion US dollars just for the US, plus a personal communication of the, ref, of the repair versus control for one city in the US, New Orleans. It's a personal communication. And then this final one, the termite control market in the United States is generally considered to account for 50% share of the worldwide market. In other words, they just doubled the value. This is the only estimate for one of the most conceivably expensive species, invasive species on the planet that actually has an absolute no estimate of cost. Uh, one wonders what these people are doing, but you know, I'm not um, an invasive insect specialist per se. Now if you plot it against species, as you can imagine, uh, most of the species have a, only a Oh, sorry, no, most of the studies are just a, a uh, sorry, most of the species are just a single study. This is why you have this massive spread along here. But the, the, the relationship holds. The more you look, the more you find. Okay. Now that's a nice little segue into the next section because we're talking about mainly agricultural pests. In fact, some of the most expensive estimates, apart from the coptotermes, come from the North American forest industry. And they're actually uh, agroforestry uh, pests. Now, insects have been uh, estimated to consume about 40% of the world's agricultural food production, which could feed a billion people. Now, at the same time, that's a rather, I guess, a ironic value in the sense that today it's estimated that a billion people are malnourished, so well, or starving. There's another billion people on top of that billion 
that have insufficient nutrient intake such that they're immunocompromised. So there's a approximately, you know, just a, 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 between a, a third and a, a quarter of the, all the people on the planet have a food shortage issue. So if we could somehow magically, of course we never will, get rid of the component that's just on the agricultural side, we could save a lot of lives. Now, but on, in, in the health, I'm, I'm not going to include that component in the health. You can see also where I'm going with this is that I'm, I'm identifying the holes, I'm identifying what we're not studying, yet I'm still blowing your minds with just the numbers that we're talking about. So on the health side, what does it look like? Well, you'll notice here that malaria is conspicuously missing. As I said before, because in almost all areas it's considered endemic, it's not an invasive issue per se. That's not to say that it won't be in the very near future, but on most of the damage, you'll notice this is also the log scale, most of the cost is associated with a single disease, dengue or dengue fever, which um, I don't know if anyone's ever had here, I've had a few friends have it. It's like you're going to die for a very, very long time, but don't get the relief of death. Uh, it's, it's a nasty, horrible thing. It doesn't kill you quite as much as, say, malaria does, but you wish you were dead. Um, the, other, the other interesting thing is that the recently emerged West Nile virus in, in, uh, in the US and North America generally is one of the second highest, followed by chikungunya, which is probably uh, one of the scariest things from, from my perspective in Australia because it's, uh, it hasn't been there before, but it's slowly creeping down from Papua New Guinea and it could easily nip across. And it's, it has been detected in a few places, but thankfully eradicated. Now, we don't have quite the same problem with the unreliable versus reliable studies. So we're still um, talking about, I'll, I'll put the numbers up shortly. In terms of the species, vastly fewer species are responsible for the health damage. Of course, the 80s, uh, Aegypti and Albopictus, mainly for dengue. Uh, the Culex, Pipians and, and Tassalis for the West Nile virus. Solenopsis invicta, uh, the red fire ant for um, the allergic reactions. An interesting one, uh, both German and common wasps are down at the bottom there. Uh, most of those disappear though when you consider the reliability. Now, across regions, it's again very similar, except this time Asia sort of comes out top uh, when we consider the reliability. And if you add it all up, you're looking at about, you know, just shy of six billion annually, which is about an order of magnitude lower, surprisingly, than the goods and services damage loss. Uh, now, we can do the same thing, of course. We can relate this to the number of studies, and you see the, uh, the same sort of relationship, albeit it's a lot weaker because we have much fewer, um, many fewer studies to go on, plus it's dominated by that single big dengue outlier. But if you do the same thing that we did before by region, you're looking at between sort of one and a half to two times the estimate, still bringing it to less than an order of magnitude lower than the goods and services. If you do it by disease, it's even a little bit wonkier because again, that dengue thing is so far out there that it can climb three to five times. But again, worst case scenario, you're still looking at under an order of magnitude lower. Okay, that's the human health. Now, ecosystem services. Uh, these are something we talk about a lot of time in this business, especially in the sustainability side of things. It's one way we focus on trying to get people's attention about what we should be doing uh, to, to maintain our planet and the life support system that it has. But I, it doesn't really mean much to people. When you, first of all, ecosystem services is a terrible term. I like this image because to me, it's the idea that you know, we do live in a house and just like you don't use the toilet in your kitchen, we shouldn't make a mess of the planet because this is also where we eat and where we survive. Now, let's just focus on one of the most important ecosystem services on the planet, pollination. And Einstein couldn't have said it better. Um, you know, this, is, this is probably very true. And I'll give you some of the stats underlying that preconception. I liked this one a little bit better. Uh, this is my own invention. Um, <laughs> I really, I think we should respect the bee. I, I have a few bees on my farm in Australia, a couple, and I have a notoriously difficult time collecting my honey. I also make mead from it, which is a, one of the best alcohols ever made. But just to give you some background, if you're not up to speed on your pollination services, let's just go through, through some of the facts. So 90, over 90% 90 of flowering plants need animal poll pollination of some description, and over 80% of all human crop species. Now, that equates to about 35% of all human food. So on average around the world, one in three bites of food you take 
come about because of pollination. Um, there's some estimates about the uh, cost, 153 billion euros annually. That's a 2005 estimate. Again, difficult to source. Half of that pollination comes from a single species, Apis mellifera, the common honeybee. And, but, and wild pollinators cover the majority of the rest. Now there's 20,000 thereabouts bee species on the planet. 5% of them are social. That means they produce a honey-like substance. And only, well, less than 10, depending on the taxonomists you talk to, species uh, of Apis genera, of which Apis mellifera is. Now the native bee contribution is generally much, much greater than appreciated. And not as much as abundance, but wild species diversity actually accounts for higher yields from pollination than the total abundance itself. Uh, proximity to forest accounts for that increase in diversity, which leads to higher pollination, rural ve vegetation, any place that gives more niches. Now, beekeeping is an increasingly popular uh, practice around the world. However, the die-offs which and declines somewhere between 25 and 60 percent uh, between Europe and North America mainly, due to agricultural intensification, mites, pesticides, habitat loss, disease and climate change combined, meaning that we're in a, and, and varroa mites being a big part of that, which haven't thankfully entered Australia, mean that we are losing, remember half of all of our pollination of our food comes from a single species that's crashing around the world. Alarm bells should be ringing, especially when you consider the tra trajectory for the human population over the next uh, 100 or so years. I found one study around the entire planet. It's a fantastic one. It's a New Zealand example where the German and the uh, common uh, wasp were introduced uh, about 30 or 40 years ago and have, have really exploded to the point where they're the highest densities of these two species anywhere on the planet. This study includes both health costs and some of the great, some of the health costs were, were hilarious. They've actually quantified the cost of wasps getting into people's cars when they're driving so that they sting them and they crash and you know, have all sorts of you know, broken bones and some of them die. I think that was a fantastic extension of the, uh, the health issue, which I did include in those estimates as well as of course, uh, loss to the, uh, the, the uh, honeybee industry. But some things that they did go even farther were the true ecosystem services associations with pollination to the point where including um, uh, pollination losses to agriculture as well as even the pollination that's uh, impeded by the presence of wasps on native pollinators and, and honeybees as well on clover patches in pastures such that farmers have to add a lot more nitrogenous fertilizers to keep their pasture quality up can equate in itself to 40 million US dollars per year in one small country. Now this is the only study of its kind on the, on the planet. And arguably it's a very big problem in New Zealand and a lot of attention, but I find it staggering that this is, this is all we can find. Now some other examples that aren't terribly well costed, and when we talk about ecosystem services, most of them relate to some aspect of intact forests. So we're talking about carbon regulation, carbon sequestration uh, and storage, as well as nutrient fluxes. I won't go through all of them here, but you can see that, and there's the aesthetic component as well, just basically forests being nailed by these species. How to quantify those is a difficult concept. Uh, we, don't, we can't manage to even get a reliable carbon tax on the planet, at least planet-wide yet, so it's, that's the most lucrative ecosystem service to estimate and cost and trade, and yet we still can't even do that very well. Okay, ecological cost. Now this is the most mysterious part because while we know that invasive insects worldwide have a massive toll on ecosystems across the planet, none of them have really been put together into a sort of an overall perspective, and we hope to change that. And I'll just gonna give you some examples. So most taxa are affected by invasive insects around if you take the world uh, average everything from to large mammals right down to other insects. Most of them, of course, are on other invertebrates. This, this is a, an example of the Argentine ant in California. It's spread uh, as of February this year, and some lovely experimental work by Suarez um, this year, looking and as well as some coral geographic correlations that show that the, just the massive decline in native species diversity, native ant species diversity, after the uh, introduction of the Argentine ant. Now, 
there's other evidence, plenty of other evidence. Uh, Argentine ants also reduce native pollinators in South Africa across many different uh, orders of both insects and um, arachnids. Uh, they have caused 75% reductions in, in honeybee pollination in parts of the US, as well as reducing cactus seed and fruit set in the, in the southern US deserts. Our little friend, uh, the red imported fire ant that um, climbed up my legs, also displaces, as you can probably imagine, many other species, not just humans, mammals, birds, reptiles. Uh, it also rec it vastly reduces native invertebrates in areas. And one of the most infamous examples of native insect damage on ecosystems is the complete invasional meltdown caused by the yellow crazy ant on Christmas Island. This is the place, of course, famous for its uh, uh, land crabs. You, you've seen the, the videos of the photos of the all you can see is little scurrying crustaceans all across and this mass migration of the land crabs uh, onto the land and then back out to sea. And with the invasion of the yellow crazy ant, it's, it, it, it attacks, as you can see, it attacks the baby crabs and wipes them out from areas to the point that not only has it completely changed the ecosystem and caused extinctions, it's actually led to re secondary reinvasions because of things like invasive land snails couldn't get a foothold with the crab predation that was going on. When you remove the crabs, these other species come in. It was described uh, as the, in, the classic example of invasional meltdown. Do we have a cost for that? No. Other notable examples, megastigmus wasps, these are tiny little gall wasps, um, reduced tree regeneration. We've got uh, the balsam woody adelgid, uh, reducing old growth forests. We have, and something probably everyone's seen here, the little uh, seven spot ladybird. Uh, it's all across Europe now. It's, a, it's an Asian invasion. I've got them in my house in south of Paris. You open the shutters and they, my daughter can attest to this. She loved them because she, uh, every little girl likes ladybirds, of course. Uh, they would just flood in and every single one of them was an invasive seven spot ladybird. Now, they have, an, they have a massive uh, dimorphism as well as different uh, color variants and morphs but they almost completely displace native ladybirds. And these are one of the primary agricultural pre um, pest predators in this part of the world. And they've just taken over. Now, we're still in our early stages here, so I'm not gonna go much more into detail. This is what we want to do. Now, don't go away and steal my idea. Uh, I'll make the database available afterwards. But the, it, in, four years ago, we worked on a, well, an analogous problem where we had a lot of ecological damage to deal with, but no other way of quantifying them apart from the paired comparisons meta-analysis. So what we did is we took an area where there was some deforestation and an area that was similar where there wasn't. Two studies were done. It was measuring some aspect of biodiversity, total number of species, uh, the, the abundance of those species, the species richness, and comparing that aspect between the place that was disturbed and the forest. And you can see we've got abandoned agriculture up the top, um, active agriculture all the way down to shaded plantations, different forms of forest disturbance. And we quantified all the different response variables in the, in the, in the damaged versus undamaged areas, or relatively undamaged, and, and standardized using a bootstrap procedure the effect size. And in this, sorry, we made this, um, this scale so that the more positive they were, the farther they were from a no effect. So this means that if it was on zero, there would be no effect. Uh, but over here, the, the greater the effect, whereas the negatives would actually indicate, in this case, a benefit. It was just uh, was easier to show that way. Uh, and you know, these are the, where the studies came from around the world. This is focusing on the tropics, of course. We showed in this particular instance that uh, there's no way you can disturb a forest without having some ecological impact. Now, that, that's not putting it in monetary terms, but we want to do exactly the same thing for the invasive insect ecological damage. Now, before I leave, I've got a few more uh, things I think are more or less on time, but there are actually benefits to some invasive insects. I don't want to get the impression that it's just all doom and gloom. There are actually some things that come out of these. Now, obviously, um, this is across all invasive species. Some of them can be used as food, some of them as fiber. We have some of them that can be used as pharmac pharmacological uh, uh, sources. We can use them as uh, control of other invasive species. Um, we have ecosystem service, some of them increase pollination. So the, while the net, uh, the net effect over most of the planet is, is a, a detriment, a, a damage, there is still some in residual uh, benefit from many of these species. 
But just like climate change is probably going to enhance some species on the planet, I think it's pretty well accepted now that most of the damage uh, is going to vastly outweigh any of the benefits. I think this is really sort of the situation we're dealing with here. Ecologically as well, a lot of different functions can be replaced, or well, different functions of indigenous species can be replaced by invasives. Even one that I like to mention a lot is this idea of ex situ conservation. Now this isn't an insect, but uh, I'll give you a good case that I worked on myself. There's a species called bantang, which is a large Indonesian native cattle species. It was imported into Australia about 180 years ago and exists on a small peninsula in, in northern Australia. Now, uh, there's about seven, 9,000 of them. They're highly inbred. We did all the genetics for them as well. Beautiful cow species. The only time I've ever been outsmarted by a cow, I can tell you that, uh, many times as it turned out. We're trying to catch these things, dart them, all sorts of things. Uh, now, in their native range in Southeast Asia, there isn't a single population with more than 400 individuals, and it's spread from Cambodia right through to Indonesia. They are in servitude. They're, they're sort of bred a lot with the Indicus species to make a beast of burden, but the wild strain is almost completely gone. So we have this invasive species in Australia that's doing, despite its inbreeding, very well, thank you very much, uh, but it's almost assuredly going to go extinct in the wild in Southeast Asia within the next few decades. What do you do in a situation like that? There are cases where invasive insects follow the same thing. Now, I'm going to end on uh, the note of, of climate change. Uh, this is where it gets even more complex because um, some of the work that's been done recently, this is just a, a global distribution of invasive species under current and future scenarios. So this is the A1B um, scenario to 2100, looking at different biomes. Now, it's hard to see there, but uh, in the temperate biomes, we see on average increases, but you can see a massive spread, whereas in the tropical areas, we actually predict a reduction in invasive species. This is all invasive species. If we just focus on terrestrial invertebrates, of which insects are the most, you can see that the trajectories go all over. This, this paper was published a couple of years ago by one of the lab members um, of France, um, Céline Bayach, who's actually still involved in this work. And uh, when you sort of total all that up and look at the change of the insects, it is on average an increase, but as you can see, it's a highly variable. Now, these are only invasive species here. If you look at single species, this is just one for which basic niche models have been done, species distribution models, as you know, the fashion in ecology, do a species distribution model, project it through into the future, and so you see that's what it's going to be in 100 years. Well, you know, no species lives in a vacuum, but it's an indication of the thermal capacity of the potential for that species to increase. This is the white-footed ant, Tectomyromex albipes. Uh, it's a household pest. It doesn't really cost a lot of money. Uh, it does for eradication, but it's just more of a nuisance than anything. Just showing this massive increase, mainly through the tropical zones, based on, just to 2050, based on this. Now, this is some more work that's been probably a little bit scarier. This is the predicted distribution of um, the Aedes albopictus, this is the main vector for dengue fever as well as chikungunya in the southeast of France over the next um, 100 years. And this is just, you know, uh, long-term SDM predictions here. This doesn't necessarily mean that the virus itself will be introduced, but if the vector is there and in those quantities, the likelihood, especially with, you know, we think we have refugee problems now, I mean, it's only going to get worse and where do the source of a lot of these diseases come from is from people moving around. On that note, despite climate change being uh, a pretty much, I guess, a sure, sure thing that, that many invasive insects will increase their range, it's not, necessary, not necessarily the case that their impacts will increase. However, if you look at the primary correlate of invasions of insects around the planet, it's linked to human population increase, trade, and human movements. Now, all of those things are increasing. This is work, um, well, I have to do a plug for all my own work, of course. This is work we did last year, just looking at trajectories of the human population. Essentially, the take home message is that we're looking at no peak in human population this century. It's, it's, only, it's, it's not possible no matter what happens, even if there's a war, a major war. Uh, but as humans increase, as movements increase, and as, as borders sort of dissolve in trade agreements, which they're happening on, the TPP, which is just freaking me out about Australia, poor Australia, we're going to get drowned, uh, means that there's, it's, it's, it's a guarantee that most of these invasive insects will be increasing their impact. And you add that in with the probable aspects of climate change, it means all of these minimum costs are going to continue to rise.
just a couple things finally. While we have a good handle on these, these areas that are easily, easily, I say that, more easily quantified in terms of money, that the, the, I think we really need to focus on the ecosystem services side of things. And that's my plea to you. If you have anything to do with invasive insects and you can measure these things and quantify them in terms of real money, I think we have a chance to convince more people that this is worthwhile. So I just want to finish with a few conclusions. It's indeed the tip of the iceberg. I think that we've demonstrated that uh, all the costs, many of them in some cases, uh, two-thirds of them are so poor as to not be quantifiable, but that the, uh, the remaining ones are so few and so high that we're talking about uh, just a fraction of what the annual costs really are. The more we study, the more we find. The, the human costs do not include the malnutrition, so you know, I, I wouldn't hazard a guess just how much increased misery is caused by invasive insects from, from just the, the malnutrition component alone. I could think we can all agree that things are only going to get worse for most species. But a, a fundamental theme of most of the, uh, the papers we looked at and the reports was that early intervention vastly decreases the amount of money that needs to be spent. So the, uh, the, it's just a little, the climate change action now, while expensive, will cost us a lot less than if we do nothing. And it's exactly the same story with invasive insects. So with that, I just want to, uh, this is my very French photo of Franck looking very French. Uh, actually, this is in Adelaide in Australia. He came and visited me last year. Uh, we did nothing but eat. It was fantastic. All these wonderful people here, including BNP Paribas and the Australian Research Council that's helped me um, do a lot of this work. I, I report a lot of this sort of thing on my blog, Conservation Bites, down at the bottom. Uh, if you have any questions, um, feel free to contact me. And lastly, my, my plug uh, of my latest book just came out. It's called Killing the Koala and Poisoning the Prairie. It's a, it should be a fun read. We basically call everyone uh, an asshole. It's, it's a, a bit of a rant. Uh, with Paul Ehrlich, who is my co-author, an 84-year-old uh, dynamo who still runs me into the ground. It's, um, I hope he lives for another 84 years uh, to do more work with him. So with that, uh, I'll leave it. And thank you very, very much. <laughs>